Good afternoon. Welcome to data bite number 152, Power and Retail at the Digital Doorstep. My name is Aiha Nguyen. I am the program lead for the Future of Labor Initiative, and I will be your host alongside my colleague, co-author and fellow labor researcher, Eve Zelikson. For those to, new to our programming, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to inter interrogate the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island in a network of hills and rivers in the coastal Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different system, a vast array of servers, cables, and computer devices maintained by human actors. In the United States, much of this infrastructure sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory. We commit beyond symbolic rhetoric to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. I'd like to start off by introducing our guests, Edward Anguiso and Moira Weigel. Moira is an assistant professor at Northeastern University, a founding editor of Logic Magazine. Her research focuses on digital media in a global comparative con context. And for the past couple of years, she's been studying transnational e-commerce entrepreneurs who sell through Amazon. Edward Onwiso Jr. is a staff writer at Motherboard where he covers labor, crypto, and Silicon Valley. Edward is also a co-host of the podcast, This Machine Kills. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to offer a brief overview of the reports and some key takeaways before we start our discussion. Um, in Maura Weigel's report, upcoming report, to tentatively titled The Brown Box Society, Moira writes, the, the small, writes about the small and medium-sized businesses that sell through Amazon, which are mostly hidden from customers, but whose fees are actually the company's biggest single source of revenue. Moira shows how their experiences belie the opposition between big and small that has often governed how we think about retail, as well as received understandings of how platform technologies reshape supply chains. At the digital doorstep, how customers use doorbell cameras to manage delivery workers, Aiha and Eve draw on interviews with delivery drivers with a focus on Amazon Flex drivers and video doorbell users with a focus on ring camera users from across the United States to explore how surveillance designed to protect private property is, is instead used to manage the workforce outside of that. Um, and with that, I'd love to start off by asking the participants to talk a little bit about what made them come to this research or reporting. And I think I could start off by asking Moira if she would answer that first. Sure. Um, thank you so much for that introduction uh, and to everyone who worked on putting together this event. Um, how did I get into this world of Amazon that I found myself uh, very deeply immersed in for the net last year or so? I always or I've often thought uh, recently that they're sort of a proper academic answer and then a, and a personal answer and they're both true. Uh, the proper academic answer, I think, um, is that, uh, you know, for years I'd been writing and thinking about, um, excuse me, about digital media with more of a focus on sort of search engines and social media, um, you know, on, on content, if we put it that way. Uh, I did a project connected to my work on right-wing media with Ava Kaufman and Francis Sung looking at right-wing publishing on Amazon. Uh, and through that project, sort of circuitously, uh, became deeply fascinated by Amazon's platform logics and the ways that they're different uh, from search and social media engines. Um, one, two ways of which are just, you know, it's not primarily an attention platform. Uh, I mean, it has a huge advertising arm now, but it's, it's governed by, it has sort of a different a business model, and the other way of which, uh, which was especially interesting to me as someone uh, who lived and studied in China and with a background in China studies, is that it's deeply entangled uh, across the Great Firewall. Uh, the most recent estimates show that about 50% uh, of, of all the largest third-party sellers on Amazon are in China, and sort of direct to the U.S. marketplace. So 
that's how I got fascinated in it. The human answer is that I was a human with one and then two tiny other humans who depend on me stuck in my house during COVID trying to figure out how to buy all kinds of new stuff um, that I suddenly needed for my small humans uh, and thinking in new ways that I think many of us have uh, over the past few years about supply chains and sort of how how products arrived uh, at our door from Amazon or elsewhere. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah, sorry, that was a longer answer than I intended. But once I started getting into Amazon, uh, I got too deep and I couldn't stop. Nice. I can go next and I can kind of speak for myself and maybe I have, but just jump in and what I miss. But I think that we were intrigued by the fact that a lot of the writing about doorbell cameras have kind of focused on the community surveillance and neighborhood surveillance. So like watching your neighbors, strangers, and then of course the police partnerships that Amazon Ring specifically has. And so the interesting part is that I think when you think about who is actually like most routinely at your doorstep, you know, like maybe it's your kids, but more, more likely it's the delivery driver. And so I think we were just wondering, you know, whether this technology was affecting delivery drivers in any way. And I think for me also, because we specifically focused on Amazon Flex drivers who are independent contractors, um, we were curious about kind of like the last minutes of the last mile and the conditions and experiences of this particular form of gig work. Because I think that there has been a decent amount written about like warehouse, Amazon warehouse workers and the grueling nature of that work. Um, so I think maybe in covering Amazon's broad logistics ecosystem, the flex driver feels like maybe similar to the third party seller, a bit, a bit overlooked um, in, in the ecosystem. But also, I guess, in contrast to the third party seller, who I think is kind of in, invisible in a lot of ways to the customer, the delivery driver seems to have emerged as like the only visible, visible face when you order from Amazon, right? So um, I think we were wondering kind of how this workforce is experiencing the job. And yeah, again, also in the pandemic, we're starting to see the videos circulating of drivers from doorbell cameras. Um, and I think, you know, some of these videos were like customers putting out snacks for workers. And I think we're supposed to be kind of heartwarming, but others seem to be intended to really embarrass drivers and shame them. And so I think we were wondering, like, on the side of the customer and the person sharing those videos, like, what was their motivation for doing that? And then also, what were the drivers actually thinking about this? I don't know. I have if you have anything else to add. Um, I would just add personally, from my perspective, having worked in labor and economic justice work for a while, I was seeing sort of there were tables where people were thinking about mass surveillance and what were the impacts for communities. And uh, there's been um, quite a lot of really good research and reporting done on sort of the racial uh, implications of mass surveillance with these technologies being used to discriminate or profile Black people, but there was also this desire from those in the economic justice field to really be a part of that conversation and looking for that link of like how this technology also affects people when it comes to their work. And so um, I just had this inkling that there was something there. And so that for me was an important part of this research was to try to figure out how these communities of practice kind of come together. And I, that's all I have to say. And, and word, I don't know if you, if there's a particular thing you want to contribute to that. Um, you know, the thing, I think Amazon, Amazon is fascinating because it is, you know, a juggernaut in the, in the economy and in our daily lives increasingly. And I think what drew me to it was, you know, I, my reporting has been focused or was re initially focused on gig labor and on platforms. And, you know, Amazon has both of these dynamics in interesting ways where, you know, they have, you know, uh, sort of a misclassified gig uh, gig workforce or independent contractors who they use to, and, and, and companies that they have to sort of offload liability. And this is key to the whole entire logistics empire. Um, they also have these platforms where sellers are interacting and there's algorithmic control of those. And then there's also all the range of, you know, goods and services they provide to 
to governments, to other businesses, um, to municipalities, to defense industries, where it, it feels like a very like perfect convergence of a lot of things if you want to look at you know why are certain technologies developed and 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 prioritized over others but also how you know what sort of technologies do we not want to 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 exist um what sort of incentives do we want, not want to exist when pursuing the development of tech and and what an alternative would look like that we you know might actually be good instead of pursuing surveillance or or you know militarized uh, technologies or any of these things that we find odious and i think amazon is like just the perfect you know case study in so many instances of all of that yeah that's so interesting um to think about it sort of octopus and juggernaut quality is making it a really um opportune place to look for why certain things come into being, both relations and, and new technologies themselves. Um, one thing that strikes me about uh, what you all have written, I've written, learned so much from all of your, of your writing about Amazon as, as well as other topics uh, over the years, is that um, in different ways, all of our work is thinking about how Amazon changes um, certain kinds of spaces uh, that existed before, like uh, in your report, Iha and Eve, you talk about the space of shopping or the doorstep rather kind of becoming a space of shopping and of service work in a new way. Uh, and has also changed sort of familiar cultural constructs like the American fascination with uh, shopping and, and watching shopping and even watching other people shop. Uh, I wonder if you two, are you three, uh, could speak from the bodies uh, of your overlapping work uh, about that, about how Amazon has transformed these kinds of spaces and constructs. I I can really I can start off by saying I think for us that was um, that was an important part of setting up the the report was to really recognize that the doorstep has become a space of consumption. It's at the point where something that's purchased becomes private property and it itself, it is private property. But for the worker in that space is their workspace. And so there's all of these dynamics and these different ideas about what can happen and what needs to happen in that space that makes it a really contentious space. Um, and it's also a space that isn't clearly regulated. Um, in theory, it's not actually in the home. And uh, the cameras don't record just what's immediately on the property. They can re record well into the street. And given the relationships that in some cases, some camera uh, companies have with police, it's blurring that line between what is private security and what is an apparatus of the state and what it, that can be used for. So, you know, as someone who's like looked at retailing for a very long time, the idea of like a typical retail space, there's sort of like norms and behaviors that happen in there. But in this new space of the, the doorstep, they're totally different dynamics and understandings and people's sense of power and who they are in that space. And I think, you know, that's, that's a, that's a way in which um, Amazon as the largest uh, company has been able to sort of transform what we think of as commerce and how that transaction takes place. And that transaction includes with people. Um, and I think, you know, your report, Moira, really has a great history of sort of how how retail has developed and it, or retailing and, and merchants and customers. And I'd love to for you to contribute to that. I know your report goes into it a lot. Sure. I mean, I think for me personally, as who didn't, you know, I didn't know a ton about the history of retail uh, before I started this work uh, a couple of years ago. One thing that's been quite interesting to learn about is how much of what Amazon does isn't that new, actually, and sort of older kinds of networks, um, you know, like trains in the 19th century, uh, and which played a great role in the growth of the Sears robot catalog and moving goods around in the United States, uh, how older network technologies like that uh, reorganized uh, shopping and consumption and retail in their times. I think, um, uh, and I, there's so much to say about that. I mean, I think so much of what Amazon does, uh, Walmart did before it, uh, and sort of Walmart used 
laser scanning technologies that were developed in the 60s and 70s and computerization technologies that allowed them to integrate with suppliers to develop um, this new kind of control over, over their supply chains in, in ways that aggregated power to them and pushed risks um, closer to the people making the products. Um, but one thing that I was thinking about as you were speaking just now uh, is how Amazon sort of mystifies a lot of this by seeming to despatialize it. Like the small businesses that I've spent time interviewing, almost all of them are Amazon native, uh, and yet they are small businesses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is this idea the US has like such a long history of valorizing the small business or uh, romanticizing the mom and pop business. Um, and of course, uh, that's not what this kind of, you know, a, a store with a shingle on Main Street is not what this kind of small business looks like. So it strikes me uh, that Amazon is at once like building on all these older forms of technological reinvention or disruption uh, of how things are made and get to customers, but um, but also uh, but also sort of reconfiguring the space of the market in new ways that can be very hidden through its interface. Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling, a <laughs> rambling answer. Edward or Eve, save me from myself. No, <laughs> I think actually... come to your mind. I just wanted to ask Moira if you could elaborate like a little bit on the ways that these businesses are being kind of reconfigured in Amazon's image or for Amazon. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when I set out about this research and in, starting in 2020, um, I imagined, you know, I, I'd read about Amazon's marketplace. I'd read that the fees that these third party sellers pay are the company's single largest source of revenue, you know, not of profits, but much more revenue than, for instance, Amazon Web Services, which was talked about a lot more. Um, I'd read some of the antitrust conversations uh, and read, you know, the 2020 House report on antitrust. And before I got into this research, I had imagined uh, that I would be interviewing small businesses that existed before that used Amazon to get online, right? Because this is sort of the idea that, um, or this is what a certain kind of rhetoric implies that this neutral platform is just allowing people who want to uh, to get online and bring their products um, to, to customers. Of course, uh, once I even began to scratch the surface, uh, I, I very quickly realized that it, this, this wasn't the case. And indeed, in for my report, I've interviewed, um, you know, at this point, I think in the report proper, I'm talking about a data set of 41 or 42 interviews uh, with people in the United States, Canada, China, Singapore, uh, and I think that's it, maybe one in South Asia. But, um, but uh, in any case, none of those people, no one, like not one, um, is someone who had a little store and then got online uh, through oh. Amazon. Rather, it's sort of that the, and, and indeed, actually I misspoke, there are one or two of them who were in wholesale beforehand. Um, and those people had terrible experiences of having their goods counterfeited, um, of uh, experiencing other kinds of harms and abuse, having fees go up and so on. Uh, and so I very quickly realized that what an Amazon business is, is not, you know, not the mom and pop on Main Street or whatever who decides to also sell things online, but rather this new kind of entity uh, that has to try to, for better and worse, like ride the fortunes of Amazon's platform. And for the most part, uh, the Amazon brand owners I interview who are successful, again, from Shanghai and Shenzhen and Wenzhou to um, Arizona and Texas, just thinking of some different people uh, I spoke with, are people who develop brands or products based on scraping and accessing Amazon data or from a Amazon specific Amazon analytics companies uh, that exist uh, and develop them sort of for Amazon, even if they sell a little bit on other platforms. Uh, and so in that sense, I realized that what I had to deal with wasn't just some previous, previously existing kind of person or business getting online, but rather this new kind of networked entity um, that was mm -hmm entangled in Amazon's infrastructures in all kinds of ways that make them very, very vulnerable, even though for some of them, um, if they are lucky and hit at the right moment, it can also be a space of economic opportunity. 
Wow. I think the other thing, this is like pivoting a bit more to like watching and surveillance and the doorbell cameras um, and the ways Amazon has kind of entrenched this. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking about like the Ring um, app which is like where people can go and pull up the live stream of the, of the footage. Like the fact that that app has a social network called Neighbors built into it, um, which is this like geographically gated social network where you can see, you can upload your footage. And in fact, I think when you save footage um, from the app, that like there's this huge button at the bottom that's like share to neighbors. So I think that, you know, in this way, Amazon's also really entrenching the idea that like the best way to engage with your neighbors and your community is through surveillance and is through, you know, posting footage of suspicious looking people or galvanizing around, like trying to find a porch pirate or whatnot. And so I know in our report, we mention and talk a bit about Jane Jacobs' concept of eyes on the street and this idea that the street is kept safe by pedestrians and people actually being on the street as opposed to like law enforcement um, or other forms of surveillance. And that in a way Amazon, or excuse me, this idea was then kind of co-opted by local police, um, the local police force in the sixties to, to help create neighborhood watch groups, which were like tightly bound up with local police departments. Um, and I think in this way, we see Amazon again, kind of circling back to that um, in their police partnerships with Ring, which again, make it very easy for police to like, see who has a camera, request the footage um, and do what they want with it. I think Eve, what you're talking about sort of speaks to um, the work of Emily West, where she says that surveillance is a service. So Amazon has sold people on the idea that they will be safer, that they will optimize the best customer experience and everything by surveilling their own space. And so kind of, um, and Amazon, you know, is the center of that as well. And that's another way that, that if we talk about sort of this idea of, um, uh, of Amazon sort of transforming spaces, it's like, it's set itself in this, this middle ground of trying to, if, of being part of how customers really think about the, how they have the best experience, they have to do it through this the surveillance. Um, Edward, I, Edward, it sounds like you're about to I'm say muted. something. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I think these are all good points. I think surveillance is a really key point here, right? I think that's one of the main, you know, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned with the proliferation of these like private surveillance networks um, on top of the privacy abuses and how easy it is to, and how racially biased some of the facial recognition algorithms that they're putting into this are, or the way in which they empower um, you know, uh, customers, as you talked about in your reporting, uh, empower them to, you know, sort of act as bosses and allow Amazon new revenue streams by just managing workers and punishing them and disciplining them. But I, but I think this, uh, this, you know, the surveillance is also a key development here for them because, you know, as you talked about what Amazon's doing isn't necessarily new. And, you know, for the past, you know, you know, a few decades, we, surveillance has increasingly been used, you know, when you're offering new sorts of, you know, assets or, 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 you know, goods or services for the consumers to, for consumers to, you know, um, to consume, um, to ensure that there is, you know, some standardization of them, but also that people are going to be using them, producing them, consuming them at a, you know, at a, at an ideal rate, right? And I think that this is, you know, with, we, you know, with surveillance capitalism or with the recent uptick of, of interest in surveillance capitalism. And I, I, I remember reading this review by Evgeny Morozov that highlighted uh, surveillance capitalism in the monthly review that talked a little bit about how, you know, there have been iterative periods after the post-war period uh, where surveillance was deployed in marketing or deployed in finance or deployed in industry, right, to, to offer new products and to ensure the population would have a certain relationship with them, to normalize them, and then to build up more products and services. And I feel that with Amazon, you know, Amazon has its tentacles in all of these things, or is attempting to in all these things, but also with, with e-commerce and the ascent of e-commerce, offering new ways to try to figure out how you can embed customers even fully into its ecosystem and subdue them to the logic of, you know, the, entering the platform in a certain way or interacting with its workers in a certain way that not only ensure it has consistent, you know, revenue or reliability of customers coming back, but also 
goes a long way in structuring how people can even fight back or push back against the system, right? If you have a very ordered relationship to those delivery drivers, or if the logistics system is organized in a very certain way, you're not going to see most of it. You're not going to also be able to, I think, work with um, delivery drivers, work with warehouse workers, or feel outrage at their conditions, right? They're, they're, that it, it's as much like the surveillance is both a way for them to ensure that people are consuming their things or their goods or it feels like their goods and services in a certain way, but also that they're staying out of the site of, you know, these sites of production so that you don't actually um, disrupt what it's like, you know, when you go down into it, a very fragile set of arrangements to make sure that the factory runs on time and that you know, the delivery trucks are running on time when they really never are. Like they're always behind a schedule. They're always on unrealistic production uh, quotas. They're always sensitive to very sudden shocks and supply chains. They're, they're run on systems that are monopolized by Amazon. And so like a single disruption of a database or a server somewhere can, can throw the whole thing into whack, right? But tight control of individuals at various points allows them to ensure the whole thing comes along, even if it has a massive social cost of, of you know, encouraging people to be as anti-social as possible if they have the right, you know, conditions around them, right? Or it, even if it comes at the cost of workers and their and their bodies, even if it comes at the cost of communities and the comfort of people in them, or even if it comes at the cost of like constantly profiling and bias, uh, you know, and harassing people who are not white. That to me, the, I like the what you said earlier in that of like embedding, embedding the customer in this system too, because like that also makes me wonder how that, how that like works with Amazon, like how much it prides itself on being customer a customer centric co company, mm -hmm. and I just think like we heard this over and over again in our interviews with drivers of like the, the customer is always right. Um, in regards to how that all can also have like very harmful consequences for them in that they always believe the customer if they the customer says that like the driver knocked over the pot or threw the package, et cetera. And then again, that can get them kicked off the app and deactivated entirely. And so, yeah, in, in the efforts to be so customer centric, there are such clear and harmful consequences for the workers. And then I think like, because the the whole experience of ordering something on Amazon is very personalized in certain ways of like the algorithmic recommendations that you see and the fact that you can like literally specify exactly where you want your package to be dropped off like a direct byproduct of this that I think we talked about a bit in the report is that the like customer service norms are totally within the control of the customer and they change because they're individualized. Yeah, I think that's another, you know, like, whether it's the rating system, whether it's this ability to leave the feedback, all of these things, you know, the gig, you know, the gig economy, I think is the more like the example most people are familiar with, you know, either because of the ubiquitous nature of it or because of how much documentation there's been about how it can just throw someone's life um, into chaos if you give them a bad rating or feedback. But, you know, like you said, like structuring it in that way also just you know, I was really struck by what how you guys put it in your report about how they just were able to turn what was initially a cost, which was, you know, asset protection into a new revenue stream. Um, and that Amazon is really ingenious in the ways that it's able to uh, take a situation that will probably work against it. You know, how are you, how are you going to make sure um, that the packages that you're delivering on unrealistic timetables are going to be there when the customers get there? Um, and they result, you know, they did it by creating like a workforce that they're not legally liable for um, so that they can subject them to really horrible working conditions and then have them subjected to horrible customer service conditions, right? Um, and they make money at each step of this, as much money as possible at each step of this by structuring it in like the most socially harmful way, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and floating all these responsibilities on everyone else. Sorry. Yeah. I, oh, no, sorry. I was thinking of your report, um, but also to this theme of of uh, offloading responsibilities um, that I have become really fascinated with the ways they do this. There's a business model of Amazon sellers that's called arbitrage or retail arbitrage. Um, that's a basically about trying to find things that are for sale somewhere cheaper than they are on Amazon and reselling them on Amazon. Uh, but but through speaking to informants who do this, I've really started to think of arbitrage as like 
an alternative or complement or in addition to surveillance as like a way of describing the logic of this entire system of sort of shifting, um, you know, making a profit by uh, exploiting greater knowledge to move things around and shift responsibilities and risks for as long as you can get away with it. Uh, but actually, that just occurred to me as you all were speaking. Uh, what I wanted, what I wanted to ask about was like, you know, I asked earlier about changing spaces, um, sort of cultural constructs. But one of the things that was so poignant to me in reading your report, Iha and Eve, were these anecdotes of how, how this you know, this technology and the way Amazon uses technology to restructure certain social and economic relations, how it changes the way human beings relate to each other, because some of the things you that your interviewees describe to you feel so um, subhuman on the part of the customers, you know, like the way that they're treating um, delivery workers and, and expect people to behave. And it seems there's a way the technology sort of um, disciplines or encourages those who use it to behave in these in these sort of what I think of as inhuman um, ways. So I was wondering if if you or Edward could speak to this question of like changing the texture of of interpersonal and human interactions. I was actually thinking about that too as Edward was speaking. Is sort of the system has allowed us to sort of change the relationships that people have with one another. And it's interesting you mentioned, you know, the, the snippets from the report that we had, we originally were thinking about writing it almost as a conversation between customers and drivers, because oftentimes they were on the same page with a lot of things, but wanting different outcomes, right? One of the things we saw was that drivers, delivery workers were very aware that they were being watched and customers wanted the drivers to know that they were being watched. So there was almost this sort of like, well, I have to behave a certain way because I know this person can see me and this other per person on the other side of the door going, well, I know they know that I can see them. So I'm going to give them instructions on how to behave this way. So it really has like, in, in that instance, changed the relationship that customers are having with delivery drivers who probably are, you know, as Eve said earlier, the face of Amazon. So if anything goes wrong there, it really shapes how they, how a customer may think about, well, do I trust Amazon? Amazon has an incredible high level of trust. And I'm sure Edward has done a lot of work on this, how people perceive of Amazon. It, I think it's more trusted than the U.S. military, <laughs> and by, uh, which, you know, depending on who you're talking to may or may not say a lot. Um, but but by far larger than yet other company. And so, you know, um, by sort of like creating this like interface that Amazon owns and has access to the footage, they curate that type of relationship. And um, as Edward said earlier, it was ingenious because Amazon has taken what was something that used to be a labor cost and turned it into a revenue stream. But in that process, it's, determining how people get to interact with, with one another while still controlling one in the end. So I, I see that as one way, but I also sort of like um, seeing through this experience, probably society at large is having a different relationship with this company. Um, and also how uh, customers may view or not view at all the sellers that are actually the ones selling them items. So I, I would love to see how that that may shape out and hear from you guys how that may shape out, shape out from your perspective as well. I mean, oh. one metaphor, sorry, no, Edward, you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, I think like the trust thing is um, a really fascinating one, especially because Amazon does have a lot of, or in the recent years, has had an increasing issue with, you know, counterfeit goods on its um, on its platform, as well as, you know, friction with startups and businesses for straight up stealing um, ideas from them, um, or copying services, or you know, you know, hijacking an operation that they had, um, as well as you know. Um, driving sellers off of the marketplace. But despite that, it has still rode out, you know, and, and had a pretty high opinion in the public, which is, I think is an interesting thing. I don't know also, like, 
I'm always curious about when, you know, like a company has all these scandals, has awareness of the scandals, also has like, you know, the specific group of people that it's antagonistic to and everyone knows about it, that they still ride out the, the, um, the, the PR scandals or the media cycles as having high trust, maybe I guess because of like the day-to-day -day reliability for a lot of people who still need their services because of a gap in public infrastructure. Yeah, I have to say, um, since I've been working on this project, it's been very striking to me how often when I happen to just tell someone, you know, like uh, someone I'm having lunch with or like someone on an airplane or I don't know, just anyone, <laughs> what I've been researching, how often the person starts sort of spontaneously apologizing or confessing to me that they shop, <laughs> that they shop on Amazon. And I've confessed in print, I too sometimes shop on Amazon, which I think there's basically no excuse for actually. I think it's basically, I don't know, yeah. I don't excuse myself. What? <laughs> We saw the same thing with some of the customers we talked to, sort of this like, oh, I only use it when I need to. Right. But it's this very, um, it seems to me, because I believe last I looked, I mean, the statistics are that it's the most trusted institution in the United States after the military. And if you, with some sampling that's like Democrats and Republicans, it's the most trusted, like across, across political affiliation. And so there's an enormous level of trust. Uh, and yet, and yet also this like conflicted or bad consciousness feeling, which I think reflects that in many ways, um, you know, it's this vast predictive machine like optimized to hook in customers. And it does it does actually work very well in certain ways by promoting abusive behavior uh, of of delivery workers, of third party businesses in many cases, and also passing on or handing off risk. Mm -hmm. um, Another thing I'd be very curious to hear you all speak to, one thing that I've been trying to think through and I haven't really like conceptualized properly, but that is, is this, that there's a way in which Amazon creates these situations in which they've sort of created the new social situation where there's some kind of problem or harm. So let's say they're counterfeit. So they're dangerous goods or, um, you know, someone is knocking off your stuff or, I don't know. A diff those are the kinds of examples I've encountered talking to the small businesses. But whatever the problem is, the solution is like more Amazon and more surveillance. Um, so it's like the policing mechanism that's in place if someone is making false claims or selling dangerous goods or so on is to, I don't know, it's like you get suspended and then Amazon is the only one who can police it, <laughs> right? Um, one of the most interesting things I found, which I'm still doing research on, and I don't know as much about as I'd like to, is that Amazon has, from what I've read in Chinese language reporting, has actual police part, like partnerships with provincial police in China to try to crack down on counterfeiting and certain kinds of fraud um, and data sharing agreements uh, with them and so on. And in 2020, Amazon, along with Alibaba and some other firms, started these new data sharing, this new data sharing program with the Department of Homeland Security uh, uh, around counterfeit and damaged goods. And on the one hand, it's like, fraudulent medical equipment at the beginning of COVID, that, that's bad. Like fake masks are bad, that we don't want a vast machine like promoting and selling that. And at the same time, the solution to any problem is, you know, Amazon suspends the account and asks for every single step of your supply chain to in order to unlock your account back. Or, um, you know, Amazon will install this camera to, to watch you or something. And so I sometimes struggle with trying to figure out normatively like what I think should be done or think about fake ads. It's like Amazon creates this transnational marketplace and fake reviews, excuse me, not in ads, uh, which totally undermine the integrity of, of product reviews. And then the solution to that is to start charging sellers tons of money for advertising and to not pay attention to customer reviews anymore at all. So this way that Amazon creates problems and then the solution is always like more Amazon surveillance and more and more mm -hmm. money to Amazon. And that's something I'm trying to think through. I'd be very curious if you have any thoughts on that. I think maybe a parallel of that is like the, the porch pirate and the package theft. Like we can't, you know, secure the goods. And then we're also seeing more legislation that's criminalizing, making the penalty for package theft, like moving it from a misdemeanor to a felony. I think there have been like eight states who have passed laws doing this. And so then it becomes, you know, okay, law enforcement's going to spend more time ooh, and resources investing in package theft. And you need a ring doorbell camera because that's the only way that we're going to be able to tell if 
you know, you know, who stole your package and be able to return it to you. And so, yeah, it's just a similar situation. Oh, also, I'm supposed to tell everyone in the audience to please submit any questions you have, um, if you have any questions. Or I think of the detail in your report, which was a very fascinating finding to me. Um, it makes made perfect sense once you all explained it, but I had never thought of it that certain drivers thought of the ring cameras as like insurance for them too, that it's like, oh, this could be evidence that I didn't steal something or kick over the flower pot or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like there's this pernicious way in which in addition to restructuring relations um, of work and worker, consumer and management or public and private um, or, uh, you know, small business and customer. Uh, and I have to say, because it's because I, I failed to say it earlier and it was such a striking thing to me, you know, Amazon native businesses get small business loans, you get minority small business loans, CFDI loans and so on to start Amazon native businesses, which means Amazon is garnishing on average 34% um, of, of, you know, funds that are for small businesses in um, to support the growth of small businesses in distressed communities uh, in theory. But anyway, um, the it just strikes me that it's like they create these kind of new forms and new situations, but then the solution to the social harm is always like more surveillance and more arbitrary and opaque, you know, not overseen regulation by Amazon. Yeah, I think this actually brings us into another thing that I've been thinking about is like the just the power relationships and the shifting power dynamics that Amazon has created. And, and what does it mean for customers and workers and really society at large that, you know, much of the architecture underlying American uh, commerce has been built by or is like built up around Amazon. And so maybe we could talk a bit about some of the power dynamics, which I know we really have been talking about for the past um, 40 minutes, but, and how maybe how they could be shifted in, in one way or another. I'm glad you're taking a positive conclusion to this instead of controls <laughs> everything that we do and we have no choice but to surveil one another. Yes, no, definitely not. I mean, I'm, I mean, I can start off and talk about my, what I think of that personally, which is, I think my point in when I when we walked into writing this report and for me, one of the things in the back of my mind was that um, this is an opportunity to call people into the conversation around mass surveillance who may not have been available, who may have not been not available, but not really seeing their role within it yet. And I think we tried to accomplish that by really expressing this neighborhood surveillance as a labor issue. Right up until this point, so much of neighborhood surveillance is seen as a racial justice issue that doesn't have a clear economic and labor component. And so, hopefully, by like pulling people into, we sort of um, re knit those social networks and those social connections that are kind of like being broken up by this, by the decentralizing ability of technology and also, you know, this reliance on sort of watching other people as opposed to watching one another. And so I think that that what that's one way that I see, um, a new relationship potentially forging rather than being broken and a new power dynamic being able to, to potentially be created in, in this environment. And, um, and I think secondly to Moira, what you mentioned earlier about you talking to people who are like, oh, but I try to minimize my use of Amazon until it's absolutely necessary because I have a child who's under one and they need diapers right away. We also encountered the same thing with doorbell users who were saying, oh, I only use it for this and we're, you know, for safety to make sure my kids are okay. But they're completely inadvertently doing everything else that we talked about, monitoring and instructing and punishing because it's so easy. And so that relationship is like not ingrained. Maybe it's ingrained. I'm not sure. It's not obvious. It's not intentional. And so that's a space where there's agency to reclaim some of that power. So I think there's there's some opportunities. And I'll I'll stop with that. Yeah, you know, I think it's a hard one because, you know, it feels like Amazon is insulated from most consequences outside of like state intervention and massive economic, uh, macroeconomic factors. Um, but I do think there are a lot of areas to intervene on, even if those do seem outside of the realm of our control. I mean, I think that one of the core things is 
convincing people and cultivating a sense among people that, you know, just because that we do have a technological advance doesn't really mean that it needs to be deployed. And in most instances, it's uh, it shouldn't be. Well, or in most instances, when it's being advocated for, you know, by like someone who just also happens to be like the one who will profit from it the most, it probably shouldn't be, you know, there should be a closer examination. And right now we don't have that. Right now, most technology is developed by, designed by, and pushed by like private corporations who, and, and, and all the terms of discussion are, you know, framed by them or in response to them or taking note from their talking points um, in a lot of the mainstream coverage. But I do think like, you know, people who encounter these systems on their own have a better sense of like, you know, where uh, the realities of them and how to push up against them as uh, we've seen with organizing inside of, you know, this logistics empire and its warehouses and with, among its delivery drivers. Um, so I think one big question is like how to, you know, how to support that, how to make it easier and to, to do that, and also how to encourage people in their own communities, you know, to push against this because, you know, something I know a lot of people come across, I come across in my own, you know, areas, you know, a lot of people do feel that they have reasons to install these cameras um, that cannot be hand waved away. Um, and it takes a lot of work because of how much um, is out there telling people that, you know, they're under threat or under uh, or being besieged or encouraging them to take control of their front, you know, their private property um, or to be uh, domineering to a worker. Um, and, and, and part of the struggle is also like, you know, pushing back against all those things that are telling you to be inhuman and telling you to be antisocial um, because that's really the places in which these technologies thrive and encouraging people to just be, you know, not actually treat each other as they would um, if left to their own devices, but in a way that's, that happens to be, you know, profitable for these companies. That was really well said. Yeah, I hesitate. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I have, this is minor and mostly just echoing what you both said, but yeah, I think just like thinking very critically about the also the technology we bring into our homes and our lives and how we use them. Like, you know, do we want to be subjecting a low wage, highly precarious, like largely minority based workforce to constant surveillance in which each customer has a different idea of like what it means to perform the job adequately. Um, I think just people need to start thinking, thinking about that. Um, but I do think there's been a lot of good work done in kind of connecting the dots of Amazon's power and influence. Um, and also like the conditions, like Edward, your reporting and Vice Motherboard's reporting at large has done such a good job of highlighting like the really inhumane labor experiences at in various Amazon positions. So I think also reporting and writing on that is doing a lot of work, a lot of the hard work as well. And I think it's important that, you know, the reporting also connects it to society, like what it says about society overall. Right. It's not, you know, what sort of cultural attitudes are we um, developing as a consequence of something that's become sort of so important in our, our, our daily lives. But at the same time, I think Moira's report um, also highlights, which people seem to forget, is that retail, regular, you know, brick and mortar retail is not dead and e-commerce is only 15%, 20% of all retail. So most interactions with people still happen in real life and it's we're not completely and utterly dependent. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Okay, we have a question. If, if, ever, if any other words, otherwise we will. I was just gonna say, I love um, the sort of humanness of your comments or sort of the, the way that there, uh, this research does really point to a need to think about these big and deep questions about like what kind of society do we want to live in and how do we want to treat one another because you know this vast machine that is optimized to keep everyone buying all of its customers buying everything as much as possible has so many negative consequences terrible ecological consequences um, it has all these abrasive consequences but it is also set up in a way to like pass on the pass down the costs and risks of that so that the consumer doesn't see them. So it's not enough on its own, but I, I do really think that I just wanted to echo your words about like 
drawing attention to some of the, these relations that this company creates uh, and also, you know, not just taking the cop out that like it's a structural problem and the individual can't do anything about it, um, but to, to, you know, to call us to think about like, you know, this is not a human way to treat people, um, even if there's a system set up that makes it sometimes advantageous to some people. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to, to say how much that resonated with me and what you said. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Question time. In terms, okay, this is our question. In terms of spatialization, I was wondering if you could observe any city specific changes through Amazon services and even how some infrastructures are taken over slash privatized slash monetized by Amazon in the US. I'm wondering, maybe Moira talking a little bit about like, oh, I guess in the US, I was thinking about how your report deals with US versus maybe um, third party sellers in China and beyond. You know, one thing I would say is, I think, you know, this has been talked about where Amazon's warehouses tend to be built in poor communities um, because these are places where they can offload uh, the cost of pollution, you know, when they have the delivery free, uh, fleets that are, you know, uh, emitting uh, smog and carbon or uh, where they can clog up traffic, you know, um, and where they can, you know, in general, just degrade quality of life. But I think also as they've been trying to build up like a physical in, uh, footprint, right, in, in urban spaces, both to lobby, you know, so they've you know, been introducing little stores or little offices um, in DC and in New York and, and, and with their, you know, the race to the bottom, you know, contest that they had where they had multiple cities doing HQ2, um, mm -hmm. but also just buying a valuable real estate that they can then turn into some of these sort of, um, you know, the, the, the no cashier stores, uh, partnerships with apartment complexes to implement, you know, smart tech, whether it's like Alexa when you move in or the Amazon storage lockers um, uh, and partnerships also with post offices to do the same thing. So I feel like a lot of their, their, they have levels of their physical impact where it's like, you know, they have warehouses in poor communities um, to build up their sprawling infrastructure, but they've halted building the uh, warehouses during the pandemic. They also have like the large, you know, in your face, little stores that they've been trying to build, but also like smaller things to just kind of massively expand their influence for lobbyists, for connection, for socialization with um, policymakers so that they can have more, uh, you know, more, more ease on the legal side. And I feel like all of these together are pretty sizable impacts that will probably, you know, snowball later in the future, more so than we're seeing right now. Yeah. I'd like to add, I'd like to piggyback that on that and add to, I think our report focuses on Amazon ma mainly because we m spoke to people who own, mostly people who owned Ring and uh, Flex drivers, but the model of, you know, having a marketplace is no longer isolated to Amazon. Walmart, which is actually the largest retailer in the US, not Amazon, has now started their own marketplace with their own independent contractor fleet of workers, as has Target. And, I, and Amazon also recently said that it's opening up its marketplace and logistics system to people who don't sell through marketplace. So it's really created um, a larger infrastructure, logistics infrastructure, that is maybe less visible, but is sort of leading how re how e-commerce is is operating now and how things get delivered and bought and sold. And um, this may be getting a little bit into the weeds, but there's like a um, a a tertiary system of how products are sold and UPS used to do, or I'm sorry, um, the postal service used to deliver a lot of items for Amazon, but now postal office, postal service is the primary delivery for products way out in rural areas. So they're sort of being pushed out from the primary job of, of doing package delivery. And, um, and Amazon is relying on more third party and flex drivers to do that. So you might see a change in how and what the post office says look like and where where they're doing their work, which um, it as a 
private, I guess, semi-private, um, I'm not really sure how to classify the post office institution, that might change how we think about what, what um, existing public infrastructures we have. Sorry to go a little bit deep there, <laughs> the weeds. Again, this is a bit um, a field from the direct question, but I was thinking about it Iha, while you were speaking. Uh, something I've run into, and I alluded to it briefly, is the way that um, Amazon sort of benefits from the fact, and they didn't invent this, but benefits from this longstanding U.S. ideology surrounding small business and this sort of state project of entrepreneurship, right, of, um, of believing that the way to remedy uh, inequality in society is is by giving people individuals opportunities to be entrepreneurs. Um, and I mentioned both in China and the United States, um, Amazon sellers I interviewed uh, used a variety of state loans and sometimes direct subsidies uh, or tax breaks. Uh, took advantage of them to build their businesses. And these are public resources that have been designated to support entrepreneurship um, in the theory that this is the most efficacious way uh, to remedy forms of structural inequality or to get money into uh, certain kinds of, you know, communities that, that, that need it. Um, and in that sense too, um, it's not quite the kinds of privatization of municipal or public resources that the question uh, asked about, but it certainly strikes me, uh, and I mentioned Amazon takes on average 34% of, of every third party sale through fees and so on. So when you think about that as this process that ends up transferring 34% of those public resources to Amazon, um, it sure feels like, you know, a kind of privatization of, of, of public resources, even if it's not the same thing as like privatizing the post office. We have two more questions here. Hopefully we can get to them. Um, okay, so one is, um, did any of you touch on workers' sentiments slash concerns on the introduction of drones for operations slash delivery? And I guess I can say right off the bat that we did not in our report, but yeah, no, it was mostly, I mean, there were a lot of people were talking, not a lot, but a few of the delivery drivers were talking about, this is different, but Amazon's, um, the garage, the touch screen garage key, where you can go and enter someone's garage and put their deliveries right in there. And just, it's all automated. Like you have the code on your phone and the garage will just rise. But they felt really uncomfortable with that, understandably, because you're really, you're entering into someone's home. You have no idea what's inside the garage, et cetera. Um, Edward, I don't know if you've interviewed anyone or done any work on the, I think you're muted. Yeah. Uh, on the drones with uh, drone delivery? No. Uh, I have suspicions, but I haven't had the chance to talk to anybody about it. Okay, we have another one. Um, is there some change to the laws or otherwise that would cur curtail these intrusions of surveillance into people's working lives, into public spaces, into people's privacy? Are there positive examples to look to from abroad or are we all in the same boat. Make it illegal, you know. <laughs> I think you know there's there's a lot of things that could happen, but you know that would that would help. Um, uh, corporate, I mean, you know, groups have asked FTC to ban corporate surveillance specifically of the type that Amazon has been pushing out because it has uh, been not just pushing out the ring cameras, but you know, Astro, which is this facial recognition bot that re and, you know detects intruders in your home, Echo. Uh, uh, Alexa, sidewalk. I mean, it's trying to just build a, you know, dragnet. And, you know, one way to get to undermine that is to make it illegal. Another would be like, you know, I, like Mario was talking about, a lot of the focus on antitrust is big versus small. But I think one interesting aspect of antitrust or anti-monopoly discussions that hasn't been able to, I guess, maybe get as much room because it's, it's probably still too radical of an idea is like, the, or for the for where we're at in the acceptance reacceptance of it is bright lines, right? Where it's just like some businesses probably should never be allowed to enter other sorts of businesses and mm -hmm. making it, you know, banning them from entering that. And doing that would undermine a core part of Amazon's business model 
Um, and other uh, companies are trying to emulate it where you get big in one area to leverage that information to get big in another area, right? And that's really like one of the core reasons why you're able, you see all these surveillance devices across because they gain insights into what sort of products and services they should design people or for people and also like how, you know, to get them interested in them. Um, so if you could undermine some of those core logics that incentivize surveillance tech, that would help. But it's also like surveillance is a key part of how capitalism um, you know, creates new goods and services for people and convinces them to touch them. So that's also another one. That is so interesting. I'd never thought about it that way. People view monopoly as being so much about money and market share, but what if it's about surveillance? And that's the, that's the key that allows them to. Sorry, that was completely not answering the question. I just wanted to engage in the okay, conversation. Okay, I think we're at time, so I know. Oh, we are. Oh, yes, we are at time. Um, well, I want to close by thanking our guests, Moira and Edward, for their generous contributions, as well as anyone, everyone who attended this live webinar, webinar discussion. You can find a link to the report in the chat, um, and we will be sharing an archive of this talk in the coming days. You can visit our website, datasociety.net, for more information on upcoming events and other ways to get involved. Um, thank you, and have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. This was Thank very you. interesting.